USC Living History Project is an important legacy that the USC Emeriti Center offers the university. We're here to capture the personal histories and the wide variety of faculty and staff to enrich this USC legacy. I'm George Lewis. I'm a retired NBC News correspondent, and we're talking today to Murray Fromson, who ran the School of Journalism here at USC after a very successful career in journalism uh, at both uh, NBC and CBS and also the wire services. Murray, I know that you're a child of the Depression and that you and your family went through some hard times when you were uh, a young boy. Can you talk about those days? Yeah, well, I, my mother was an immigrant from England, uh, brought over by her sister, and uh, tried to arrange her with a, a marriage, which was rather an unpleasant one. It lasted about a year, which means I was born then, on September the 1st, 1929. And, uh, just that's in time for the stock market crash. Just what, a few few weeks, few months later. Yeah. That's right. Wall Street crashed and all hell broke loose, and there I was. And I ended up in uh, because my mother couldn't afford to keep me because she was unemployed and she was working as a seamstress in some different shops, sweatshops. I ended up in three foster homes, three different foster homes. They did one didn't one for another. And I, one was my favorite, the last one. My third one was my favorite. And I still, still remember Nina and Fritz Merling. They were immigrants from, I believe, Austria, but I'm not sure. So I never really, I never really asked that. I wasn't old enough to ask questions then as I did. I would have asked six months later. <laughs> well, were you eventually reunited with your mom? And the, uh, well, my mother would come to visit me. Mm -hmm. And she would bring me books all the time. That's how I learned. Uh, Wind in the Willows and old, na na old novels uh, of that time for children. And uh, she'd take me on a parade in, to Manhattan and New York to see the parade, and I loved parades. And uh, that's how I got accustomed. But I, the biggest thing is, of course, I listened to radio all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, You would have been about, what, 10 years old when Murrow was describing the Battle of Britain, the bombing of London. That's right, and I heard him on the radio, and that's what really riveted me. And I said, oh, and I just couldn't believe it. And I copied it, and I'd go to sleep with a pencil in my hand, up, uh, substituting for a microphone. Right. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet that man. And of course, I said, oh, that's impossible. That's not going to happen. But oh, it's wonderful. Is that when you first got bitten by the journalism bug? Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah, I think so. I thought, yeah, well, you know, that's the way it, that's the way it really happened because uh, I was on, uh, I was in high school, as Stars and Stripes uh, was uh, a, a budding newspaper. But when I was, I was at, at Belmont High School in Los Angeles. Now, how did you get from New York to L.A.? How did you get from New York to L.A.? Yeah. I was in the back seat of a, of a Chevy sedan that my father was driving, so I went all the way through into the South, and. Uh, I guess saw my first exposure was, by the way, I had, I had uh, Negro friends, black friends, when I was in grade school, and uh, I saw what we would today call racism. Uh, it was tough, no, you know, no drinking and warnings about what we can and can't do as we got through Tennessee and places like that, right. and uh, made our way across uh, the United States. I was in the back seat of this car, and uh, then uh, we ended up in Los Angeles. Your mother had remarried, and, and you had a new father, or was uh, no? She hadn't remarried yet. Uh -huh. She had a she had a boyfriend. A boyfriend. They eventually would marry. Uh huh. So Al Fromson. So, yeah, and uh, that happened after she got to California, and he came after her. Okay. And they got married. But I remember very well that uh, talk about the, the, the times of those days uh, when we got arrived in Los Angeles. I remember we went uh, looking for an apartment. And the first thing I remember as a child was a sign on the first lawn of an apartment building, and it said, uh, no Jews or dogs. No Jews or dogs? Yeah. Wow. And. Uh, I guess I, I knew about it, but I didn't know about it. But I knew it, and I knew it hurt me somehow. And I remembered that. And uh, then I ended up in Virgil Junior High School, 
that's where it was. And uh, my father came and took me to see um, Abbott and Costello Goes to War, <laughs> comedy out at the Pantages Theater. And when we came out of the theater, there was a young man selling the Los Angeles Times with a big headline. This headline said, Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. And that's how you found out about the uh, about well, Pearl Harbor from seeing that headline outside I, the pantry. I, I asked my father, so "What's where's Pearl Harbor? What's that?" Hmm. Well, I found out because uh, when I went back to school at Virgil Junior High School, uh, one day shortly, not knowing what was going on because there was a market about a block away from us owned by Nisei people, Japanese Americans, and um, antagonism turned after having been rec recognized by people as friends. People, the people came and bought fruits and vegetables from them all the time. But in school, suddenly, uh, three policemen came into the class one day and called out the names of three Japanese-American children, my friends, Takahashi, Kanawawa, one of the things, and they took them, escorted them out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And they were crying, and I was kind of crying, too, because I didn't know what to make of it. But they were being sent to uh, one of these relocation camps under the orders of Earl Warren, who was then the Attorney General of California. I didn't know who Earl Warren was. I didn't know what an Attorney General meant, right. but I knew he, they were being sent away. The same Earl Warren who was later associated with the school desegregation. The, the one we respect uh, is one of the great of the Supreme Court. One of the great Chief Justices of all time. That's right. right. So things happen. So it was kind of, these are things that happened to me at an early stage in my life, uh, taken away from people, taken away from things, not really, not really identifying what my life was like. And uh, one day I was, uh, my high school journalism teacher, Frances Ho, uh, heard there was an internship for young people and they got me a job at the Los Angeles Times to uh, go down because there was a shortage of men because of the war. Yeah. And so I was hired on as a copy boy at the LA Times. And uh, I went down to, uh, I went down a school bus the day that Roosevelt died. And I got on the bus and everybody on the bus was weeping. I mean, I think people didn't, didn't understand that their own president had died after Roosevelt had been president for how many years, you know third or fourth term. Right. And so here he, he, was there, he was dead. We were all weeping. And uh, so I had gone back to the Times to say farewell to a lot of people because I was, what happened was while I was, I went to LA City College from Belmont. And then um, I was on the school newspaper there. And uh, most of the, most of the students at, the, at L.A. City College were veterans returning from World War II. And then suddenly uh, I was given a job from L.A. City, from the L.A. Times. They called me to cover uh, junior college sports because I'd been a sports writer for the high school newspaper, Belmont. Mm -hmm. So I was covering that and suddenly one day they got a call and they offered me a job. The Times had a new newspaper there, the Mirror, the Los Angeles Mirror. And they hired me to be a, to cover um, uh, junior college sports, and I did that. But to take that job was the first job I ever had—a real check, thirty-five bucks a month. Wow! And I, so, so I took the job and dropped out of school at LA City College. Well, I was not planning to do that, but I did that. I lost my draft deferment. Next thing I know, I was on the way to Camp Drake to be drafted into the U.S. Army. And I was trained to be an infantryman. So at the last time, when my training was over, I was being shipped to going to be shipped to Japan. I went by the Times, and and, and Francis Ho, my high school journalism teacher, who I really loved, to say goodbye. And I ran into the sports editor of the L.A. Times. Uh, I forget his name right now. I know it very well. But he said, "Where are you going?" I said, well, I'm in, the ar I'm in the Army. I'm heading for Japan and probably Korea for the Korean War. And he said, well, you know, I was, uh, uh, he said, I was, I was a officer, commanding officer to cover the, the Stars and Stripes Army newspaper when I was in India. 
He said, let me take the number down. I said, I'll get hold of you. And the next thing I know, I was at, in Japan, shipped over from Camp Drake, and my name was called out. There were 58 guys, myself and one of the men, Tim Adams, and uh, we were sent to Stars and Stripes in Tokyo. And they said, well, you're a sports writer, so you cover sports. <laughs> I got pigeoned. I couldn't get away from being a sports writer. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, one day there was a, a big scandal broke. I don't know if you remember this, but West Point had a big scandal. And the whole football team was accused of and the coach was accused of cheating. Mm -hmm. And they fired the whole football team, and they fired the coach, Red Blake. And he was thrown off out of the school. And it was uh, really incredible. And uh, so I, uh, I got a job. I, I, did, I went back and I, oh, I did a piece about, about that. I've just into getting in trouble a little bit. And uh, I did a piece, uh, tongue in cheek, about what they had done to this West Point Academy people. Ha ha, I could, an enlisted man, I was a little old sergeant, I could write this kind of <laughs> a story. You're poking fun at the West Pointers? <laughs> and those are the guys who are running the army? Yeah, right. <laughs> so they, so they, they called me in. And, uh, the colonel called me and he said, you see the story in the Stars and Stripes today? Yeah. He said, who wrote this? I said, well, I did, sir. He said, you wrote it. He said, what did you think of it? I said, well, I thought it was a pretty good piece. He said, well, I'll tell you something. I'm a West Point graduate and I hated it. You're going to Korea. <laughs> oh, God. And that's how I got to Korea. I sent to Korea and the war was on. And the Stars and Stripes, they said, to me, sure, not only are you going to Korea, you're going to go to the Marines because they hate the Army. <laughs> So I got a sign of the Marines, and I was stars and stripes. And met all these tough guys, Marines, and there was a squirt reporter, and did all kinds of crazy things. And I, I covered a, a reconnaissance raid across the Imjin River to spy on the Chinese who had come in during the war, China war with Korea. And um, we got found out. I had to float back on a rubber mattress, get back across. The leader of our group was uh, a, a young guy uh, who, uh, his name was Dutch Muhlenkamp. He came because his family was the Muhlenkamp family. They were Dutch residents who came from Holland. The mother married a, Holland, a Dutchman, and they came to the United States, and then they were married, they didn't leave, and he was going to go, she was going to go home, back to Holland. She couldn't get a leave, or he, she couldn't get a leave for her son so he could see her. Kind of complicated. Right. And I just couldn't. Uh, I couldn't do anything about it. So I wrote a story and I talked to the, I got, uh, one of our commanding Marines there who had been a retired Houston Post uh, city editor, was called to, called to action. I said, what do I do to this? And he said, well, just say the Marines uh, were unavailable for comment. So I did that and next thing I know, I'm hauled before this Marine colonel. And he said, see the story? I said, what do you think of that? Well, I said, you're not the first one to ask me. I said, yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Said, well, I'll tell you something. Said, we don't like, we don't like publicity about the U.S. Marines. I don't like that. I don't like your tone. Said, get this guy's gun and get him out of here. Threw me out in no man's land. I was in no man's land, and I'm sitting up there for two or three days waiting to get a truck, and I finally got a truck. It took me up to Penwood and John, which was where the armistice talks for the Korea War were being. This is yeah. right on the border between North and South Korea. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm in South Korea, and I got there, and I got on the, and this is the train where all the press was stationed covering the armistice talks, and I ran into a, a reporter I knew from the Associated Press, Jim Becker. He said, "Hi, kid. How are you?" And I told him the story. He said, "Yeah, they, that's how, so. This story. He said, can I see that story?" And I showed it to him. He said, uh, "Well, can can we use it for the AP?" I said, "Well, why not?" The Stars and Stripes won't run it. They're afraid to run it. So they ran it. And uh, this next thing you know, the uh, Dutch Milton Camp's mother uh, got a job from the Seattle, the Dutch consulate in Seattle, and she got citizenship. She got, uh, she got protection to stay in the States. And he got to leave, and I got a job from the AP saying, congratulations for this job you did for me. When you come back to Tokyo after the Korean War, come look us up. We'll give you a job as an intern. And that's how I got a job at the Associated Press. That started my whole real professional career. 
Now, you, you worked for the AP for how long before you went into broadcasting? About, the, about five, six years, seven years. And how did you make the transition? <laughs> how did I make the transition? Yeah. I, I, I just, how did that happen? Uh, Somebody offer you a job at NBC? Yes, I think that was right. I think that was right. Um, I'm trying to remember right now. I'm a little bit foggy. All right. But uh, I got this job at NBC. I'll probably remember, but not right at this moment. Okay. But you've, you've spent most of your uh, TV career at CBS as opposed to yeah, NBC. But I was at NBC for about six years, six, right. seven years. Yeah. You know, I was very happy with it, NBC. I had a good job with them. Matter of fact, that's how I met my wife. Mm. Because uh, when the when John Kennedy was known, if Kennedy was won the primaries and was going to be nominated, the big convention, the Democratic National Convention, was being held in Los Angeles at the Sports Arena in 1960. Yeah, that's right. And I was assigned to cover all the western states, up and down the coast, checking out delegates, potential delegates, to see what they what they were going to do at the convention. And uh, I went up there, and uh, Oregon, a bunch of people were there. One person who showed up was uh, Lyndon Johnson, LBJ, the senator, Senate Majority Leader. Because, you know, Eisenhower was the president, but the right. Democrats had Republicans. He was Senate Minority Leader. Anyway, he was <coughs> thinking pretty importantly, he was a big, powerful Texan. Right. So I just met him briefly, and uh, we got to meet each other later on. It was Quite a, quite a relationship, which I could tell you about, and spend the stories about my life with OBJ. He was quite a character. I thought eventually after all I met, he just, I was, um, I was covering, for NBC, I was covering all the things in the western states, and I'd, I'd gotten, we got back to Fort Worth, Texas, and I closed off the press room one night in the hotel. And I walked out, and I got to the elevator, and all of a sudden, this big hand, whop, stopped the elevator. And it was OBJ. He says, what you doing here? I said, well, I'm covering Nixon. What do you mean you're covering Nixon? You're supposed to be covering me. I said, I go where they tell me. He said, well, you call them fellows in New York. You tell them that LBJ wants you to come to his ranch with him. That's me. <laughs> yes, sir. So I called the NBC. And the NBC on the desk, they didn't know what to do. And Somebody in New York didn't know what to do, and they said, call Mr. McAndrew. Bill McAndrew was the president of NBC. I right. said, look at I'm just a young reporter. You want me to call him at night? <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and, and uh, McAndrew got on and said, yes, son, what can I do for you? I said, well, Mr. McAndrew, here's the, the question, as in, I'm normally assigned to do covering things for NBC, and Lyndon Johnson wants me to come to his ranch, and I don't know how to do that. He said, Son, you just do what LBJ wants him to do. Good luck to you. <laughs> that was it. I ended up to the ranch and went out to the LBJ ranch and sitting next to Tom Wicker of the New York Times and Hal Lott of the Wall Street Journal and a uh, fellow from the Baltimore Sun, who I can't remember at the moment, but I will remember. And we were having lunch with Lady Bird and Linda Johnson. When it was all over, and uh, he said, now you guys, uh, you, know, you want to stay with me because tomorrow we're going to Fredericksburg in Texas. He said, so uh, you stay here overnight. So with finding bugs for me and finally uh, he came, came out and he looked at me and he said, now you know, I know about all them fellows from New York, you know, they all know all this stuff. He said, I know all about where they were. He said, I don't know anything about you. Where'd you come from? I said, well, I... You know, I grew up in three foster homes and talked about what it was like in the Depression watching unemployed men and sitting on the curbs in the Bronx and playing cards. They couldn't find jobs. Right. And I said, I saw something about poverty. And I said, and tears began coming to his eyes. He started telling me about his own poverty-ridden life when he was a young boy in Johnson City, Texas. And we kind of bonded you know, in a way about that. We kind of identified mm -hmm. and talked about that. And that was the way it went. Um, and uh, LBJ was somebody I followed quite a bit. So we went to Fredericksburg, and that was an incredible scene. We were going for a Democratic rally in, 
in Fredericksburg, Texas. And reporters, we went into the auditorium waiting for him, and all of a sudden Johnson came out holding a baby in his arms. And one of the other reporters, what in the hell is he doing with that baby? <laughs> I said, beats me. <laughs> and Johnson looked out at this crowd of about three or 400 people, and he said, my friends, you see this child here in my arms? He said, this child is sick, not well, needs to go to a doctor. Now, the mommy and daddy are sitting over there. Their parents, they are the parents of this little baby. And they can't get a doctor in this town. And you know why not? Because they are going to vote for that Catholic, John F. Kennedy. Ooh, everybody went, ooh. <laughs> Gives the baby back to him, comes by me, gives me that nice <laughs> chest. <laughs> and we get in the car and we drive back to the ranch. And halfway up, his young assistant named Bill Moyers called in and said, uh, Senator, it's storming out here. You, you can't, you better stay with friends. He said, you just get that truck over here. We're coming home tonight. So we got to the edge of the river and the storm and they get off the truck and Johnson comes over, he gets into the car, straddles the gearing shift, pulls me in on his lap, and we walk across the ridge. Bridge, and I said to myself later, can you ever believe that I sat on the lap of a future president of the United <laughs> States? <laughs> I said, nobody will believe me. <laughs> but it happened. <laughs> Johnson's big problem as president was Vietnam, and you spent a lot of time there. Yes. Um, you, were, you were in Vietnam very early on, weren't you? Even I before there, LBJ uh, I was there to escalated. I was there the to cover the end of Dien Bien Phu, the battle the French lost, and I was covering their departure in Singapore. And uh, I, uh, I remember I was sitting in a cafe in Singapore, and there was one lonely looking foreign legion officer there sitting there. So I struck up a conversation with him, said I was a reporter, and he said, oh, the journalist. He said, let me give you advice, young man. He says, you go back and you tell their friends, don't go to Vietnam or to Indochina or whatever you, don't go there. Don't let them walk on our sheet. <laughs> I said, well, if you say not, then I will, I will passed the advice along. So we we gathered and I I was a young reporter but I organized a I knew that Foster, John Foster Dulles, who was in the Secretary of State, was um, gathering company I just come from Manila where they'd formed the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. So he was gathering for in Saigon and I got I organized a meeting of the different reporters to go and meet him. We got to the uh, press conference with John Foster Dulles and the Secretary of State, and he said, um, you know, he's boasting about the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, and that was a big deal. And he ticked off all these questions, all these countries of Southeast Asian Treaty. And, uh, and I said, well, uh, Mr. Secretary, you talked about all these countries from Southeast Asia, and you mentioned Pakistan, but Pakistan is not in Southeast Asia. And I got that dirtiest look from him. <laughs> it just was terrible. <laughs> Well, I don't want to talk about history today, but you know what the, the, the problems with Pakistan. But that was all because the United States was so upset with Nehru, who was the president of India, right. who was getting Rus arms from the Russians. So as in re respite for that, he recognized Pakistan. And we poured tens of thousands of dollars to Pakistan. And all the ambassadors were CIA agents. It was just incredible. And we had to overfly Pakistan so we could fly over the Soviet Union. Well, the, uh, the brother of uh, John Foster Dulles was Alan Dulles, who was running the that's CIA, right? right? He, he so was, it was very was, incestuous. He, that's right. He was, yeah. he, he was a senior guy. Yeah. Uh, but Dulles was Dulles, you know, yeah. as far as we could tell. Because, you know, we were always fighting right. the truth. Well, you, you kept going back to Vietnam over your career as a foreign correspondent, and uh, I know you were there just before Saigon fell to, to the communists oh, yeah. 40 years ago. Well, yes, because I went through an awful lot of covering the war. You know, I covered the war for six years. 
Six years. Yeah. Most reporters would go in and out, get their ticket punched, spend maybe a year, year and a half there, and leave. Well, I was a roving correspondent based in Bangkok, and I came back to Saigon, mm -hmm. and I was there for months on end. And I went to every battle in the battle, like Quezon and Khen Bien Phu and all these places. We finally got racked up in uh, the battle of Khen Bien Phu when my plane I was on, uh, it was one of the last trips I made. It was an, eh, we're dumping ammunition to the Marines uh, in Korea, in, Viet in Vietnam. Was this at Quezon, at the, the Marine Quezon. base in Quezon? Quezon, Quezon, Quezon yes. that's right. Yeah, near the, n near the demilitarized zone separating the two Vietnam. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Some of it gets a little bit, yeah. you know. But um, the plane was under fire. And, uh, oh, the first time we went in, the plane in front of us got blown off the airstrip. So they said, we're going back to Da Nang, we're going back to Da Nang, and I was looking for a place to go. You know, another plane, and one of the cameramen, uh, come and he says, what? Murray, what the devil are you going on here? Is you too old for this stuff? I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm working for it. I'm working for CBS, and I gotta go cover the story. So they looked at me with bewilderment. But I got, a, I got on this plane, and this next plane was going into Quezon, and uh, came, came under fire. And uh, the pilot said, oh, look, at, I'm gonna make a combat load here. Props are gonna be going, propellers are gonna be going. He said, I'll open the rear doors. I want you guys to keep, run out, straight ahead, cut out, get to the land, and get, get to ground zero. Uh, keep the props going, because so I'm not gonna stay long. So they, the plane landed, props done, we all ran out. I had to remember, in those days we had these huge cans, if you remember, they carried film. Right. And I put one big on this leg, and another big on this leg in my pants. And as I started to run out, several rockets fell about 10 yards in front of me. And I cut to get away from the shrapnel, so I cut in front, past the wings and the propeller, they knocked me down and I fell on both kneecaps. The, n not the propeller itself, but the wind the generated wind. by it, the, the propeller? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, uh, Carl Sorensen, my cameraman and uh, my sound man, ran over and grabbed me by the arms and pulled me into a ditch. And we ended up with the Marines again. I was always, I seemed to be, I always ended up with the Marines. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> In hairy situations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, finally, uh, they got me out of there. At one point uh, in your career uh, with CBS, uh, the CBS anchorman, Walter Cronkite, came to Vietnam and, and he famously de declared that maybe we've done enough here and we ought to get out. You, had, you, you sort of had a hand in, in advising him about that, didn't you? Well, it's a funny thing. When I first met him, I uh, met with Peter Kalischer and a few other people. And he, he first came out when the war was just starting up. He wanted to know how we how were gonna win this war. And um, he came to me and I said, well, look, I can only give you my advice of what I've seen, bits and pieces of it. I said, but I have a hunch that if we got out of here, these Vietnamese, the Viet Cong and the communists and the Vietnamese, left to their own desserts, they would work this thing out themselves by blood or diplomacy, but they would do it, we wouldn't have to do it. And uh, they, Cronkite said, well, that's the most cockamamie thing I've ever heard in my life. I said, listen, Walter, I said, uh, this is just my view. You asked me my view. Uh, you don't have to believe it. And he kind of, he left at that time. You know, he was a, an ex-United Press guy, and he knew I had been with the Associated Press. So there was a rivalry there? I think it was this constant. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, because maybe you were at UPI, I don't know. No. I think it was an inferiority complex. <laughs> <laughs> United Press people didn't, they didn't like, AP was kind of like the, the fancy people, you know, big right. fancy people. So he just never gave up on me. And uh, that's how I left. And I thought Walter never really, in my long career with CBS, Walter never really, I don't say he didn't trust me, but he just had an arm's length for me. So I know at the end, of toward, one of the things towards the end of the war, uh, when I got injured, there. Uh, I've been recuperating and uh, I was ready to go back to Vietnam. I was in Bangkok and I, my legs were bandaged and I was ready to go back to Vietnam and I told CBS. 
And I was in the upstairs in the bedroom uh, getting ready to leave. I was resting, and my wife, Dodie, my love of, the love of my life, if you don't mind me saying so, she's Lord. been my strength, my lover, my cheerleader, the mother of my children. She, just a, she was just a fantastic woman. To this day, I can say that. And uh, more than 62 years, I might say. Right. And uh, she came up and she looked at me and knew I was getting back. And she laid her head down on my chest and she was crying a little bit. And I had never seen Dodie cry. That's my wife's name, Dodie. Mm -hmm. I had never seen her cry and it just broke me up. And I, afterwards I went back and I said to, uh, Brian Ellis, I think, was the bureau chief, CBS, and I said, I got to get out of here. I got to go back to the States. I can't do this to my wife. And so they reassigned me. And uh, we went to, uh, we were shipped to the States. And I said, but by the way, uh, since we're back to the States, I've been covering the civil rights movement for some time. Uh, I'd love to cover it. And they said, no, we're going to send you to Chicago. I said, Chicago? <laughs> what am I going to do in Chicago? You know, all I can think of these negative things about Chicago. But, and then I, I, I ended up loving Chicago. It was great. I was a bureau chief there, I had a wonderful bureau chief. I, won, I was a wonderful bureau, and I had a wonderful bureau chief there, John Lane, and Bill Plant, who's still working for, CB, working for CBS in Washington. Right. And we were all friends together. And it was a great time. And then all of a sudden, one day, they said, uh, the civil rights thing was blowing up in a place called Selma, Alabama. I said, why don't you go to Selma and cover the story? So I went down to Selma and, uh, with another cameraman. And I was about uh, 20 yards away when I saw John Lewis almost beaten, being beaten to death at Selma. And uh, it was terrible. The pictures, we saw the pictures. They were shown on television. You know, I think television, I think most people in this country don't realize how important television was during the Vietnam War, during the Cold War, because we really sensitized the American people to what war was really like, because we saw a lot of, you know, a lot of combat. And you also sensitized the, the audience to what the Jim Crow law was like in the South. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, when the march from Selma to Montgomery was taking place, because the marchers wanted to go there to talk about voting, the Voting Rights Act, they were hoping to get the Voting Rights Act passed, and Johnson wanted to support it. And uh, as we were going out, uh, uh, John Lewis, an aide to John Lewis said to me, uh, uh, Dr. King wants to talk to you. So Martin Luther King was making the march with us. So I went over, introduced myself, and we started walking. He says, uh, I understand you just came from Vietnam. I said, well, that's true, yes. He said, uh, well, tell me about the war. He said, no, I've, People tell me you've done some mighty good reporting there for CBS. Um, what was it like between uh, black and white soldiers in Vietnam? I said, well, I never thought about it, I said, frankly, because it was a war. Black soldiers, white soldiers, we were, the color wasn't the factor. We defended each other. I saw black guys defending white guys and white guys defending black guys. It was, it was, it was helping each other. Mm -hmm. And King was, I think, a somewhat surprised. And uh, subsequently, he delivered this incredible speech at the Riverside Chapel in Manhattan, which everybody said alienated Johnson. But it didn't alienate Johnson. Johnson was trying to do his own thing about getting the Voting Rights Act passed. Right. And he just thought that speech was a little bit out of sync for him. But he wasn't angry, and he was not a racist. I don't. I spent a lot of time around Johnson. I don't believe, I've never believed he was a racist. The King speech bothered Johnson because King came out against the war for the first time, or right, what? Right, right. And it was a very strong speech. So uh, we made the march back, and I, I was with the Dallas Towns and CBS, and I was co anchor of the live radio broadcast of the march. And King came in and he made this incredible speech about how, you know, we have seen the end. We are never going to see the end again. And uh, I was having dinner with Gordon Manning, the vice president, senior vice president of CBS, and he wanted me to 
to have dinner with a couple of the people and was promoting me from being a, a reporter to being a correspondent, which is a big deal then, you know, <laughs> with fancy titles. You know what that's like. Yeah. You're not just a reporter, you're a correspondent. And I got a call one, and uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, oh, he said, listen, you know Viola Liuzzo, this young woman who came from Detroit and one of the volunteers, she's been bushwhacked and killed. We got to get after that car of hers. So I grabbed the car, grabbed my cameraman, we raced to this highway. We found the car where she was, but her body was removed already. And uh, it was an incredible time. Uh, you know, I, I had grown up with a lot of African Americans or black people or Negroes, whatever you want to call them. They were friends of mine. I knew them. I, I trusted them from when I was seven years old. And so this whole treatment of blacks just bothered me terribly. Because I never showed that, but I, you know, that's the way I felt. So we, uh, we got to the car and her body was disappeared. And we heard that the, the sheriff there, Jimmy Clark, who was a terrible racist, uh, who led a lot of the beatings of people on right outside of Selma, he was being questioned by the FBI. So I raced over to the FBI in town, in Selma, and we waited, and the lights were on at the courthouse. All of a sudden, several other reporters, and we were waiting, and then suddenly uh, Clark came out and uh, he said, well, fellas, what do you want? I said, Jimmy, what did you tell the FBI? What do you mean what did I tell you about? Colin says, the niggas, the niggas did it. And we said, God, I can't believe this. This man is just such an insufferable racist. And, you know, I never forgot that. I just, you know, there was a string of this. And I think... They weren't subtle like they are today, were they? No, and, you know, and, and there are some of these people still forget they lost the Civil War, yeah. you know. And that's unfortunate for them. Unfortunate for the country, because I, I have great faith in the country. You know, I really, I really do believe. Whatever criticisms I have of the United States, people say to me when I ever come, well, you know, you've been in all these countries. Uh, how many? Fourteen wars you've covered. You know, and uh, well, what's your favorite country? And I said, well, no question. My favorite country is right here, this one, the United States. Really? I said, well, look at. It. Free speech, free press. That's what we have here. No other country in the world has that. And you see these people screaming and yelling in other countries, other parts of the world? They don't have it. No. That's what makes us different. Free press can't be taken for granted, though, can it? You were instrumental in helping to start the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that. It was by accident, but it would happen uh, while I was reporting from Chicago. Um, the um, Justice Minister, no, the uh, Attorney General. Yeah. John Mitchell. John Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, 1970, Nixon yeah. years. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes, he was going to subpoena reporters for the notes that they had and the people they talked to and what their sources were. And Anthony Lucas, Tony Lucas of the New York Times, was coming over to our apartment for brunch one Sunday morning. And I said to Tony, uh, Tony, you know, Mitchell's after us. He said, I'm going to tell you, they try to subpoena me, I'll go to jail for it. I will not give them up anything. He said, well, that's right. He said, well, we ought to do that. I said, yeah. I said, we all ought to do that. Every reporter ought to do that. I said, we ought to get these reporters together and have a, get a committee to talk this, a nationwide committee. And he said, well, that's a great idea. So he organized people in the West, and I organized people in the East, and we had this... Um, young man who was a senator, whose name from, I'm familiar now, who was at, uh, gave, me, gave us the, the meeting place in, at the University of Maryland, uh, Sam Dash, mm -hmm. and he gave us this meeting. And we had about 40 reporters from all over the country, and we formed the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. And uh, I may say so if you don't mind me saying, I'm very proud of the fact that that committee has lasted almost 50 years. And we have defended journalists all over the country who have been sought, who have been, tr people have been trying to get to subpoena them. And we have taken them to the Supreme Court. We've gone every place in the world. 
and it's uh, one of the proud moments of my life. And you attracted some of the biggest names in journalism to sign on to it, right? To, to lend their heft to the organization? Yeah. One who didn't do it was Walter Cronkite. Walter was, was busy. He didn't want to come. But uh, a lot of good, good people were there. Mike Wallace and uh, a lot of reporters and uh, people, what, people you knew and work, people we worked with. What was it that got you to USC? Who or what influenced your decision to come here? <laughs> Do I have to say this? <laughs> because I was a big UCLA fan at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up, you know, the Bruins and all that stuff. Uh -huh. But um, uh, I got to say, I do remember going to a Trojans game with you at the Coliseum and seeing you rooting for USC. So well, I, I know that you you converted. I uh, roots for the team that pays me, <laughs> 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 and I grew I grew loyal to the USC. I must tell you, yeah. I really. But the more I stayed, I, I met some fascinating people on the faculty, people in the university, students. People in the School of Journalism, well, the people in the School of Journalism, you know, they never knew what I was up to because uh, when I got there and got interviewed, and they said, well, what do you want to do? We'd like to have you here. What, what could you do? And I said, well, I said, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this a long time. I'd, I'd like to create a pr some kind of a instant, some kind of committee, some kind of thing in which reporters could be recognized. I said, um, and I'd like to really get a, I, I couldn't put my, quite put my finger on it. I said, I'd like to really get some foundation going to get money to get journalists from all over the country to come here and take a year off of reflection, maybe get a master's degree and, and uh, maybe a longer, and uh, look out for the interests of journalism, for accuracy in journalism, for honesty in journalism, for really getting the grips of what it was like to be a journalist and how important it was to the country. I said, without making journalism too large in the people's mind, the fact is it was an important institution, I believe, in the history of this country. And so uh, they said, well, uh, sure, if you want to do something, go ahead. The faculty said, well, the faculty's attitude was, you just go ahead and do it, don't bother us. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> so I figured, how am I going to get any money? Well, we had a, then a vice president of the university named Chet Lee, Erwin Chet Lee, who was the number two man in the USC. And he really took a liking to me, and he was wonderful, very supportive. And uh, he told me, you know, look, you got to go out and get some money. He said, I'll help you. He said, you get to New York, I can tell you the people to the Ford Foundation. I said, Chet, that's wonderful of you. I appreciate it very much. Chet had been a bomber pilot in World War II and hero and all that stuff. Now he was now an academic. And I got to New York and uh, we met at the Ford Foundation and they were so impressed by what I was thinking about doing this thing, they offered me a lot of money to start this foundation, to start this committee. Well, it's, it's, it's strange. I, I got to tell you, I, I never had enough money to think about <laughs> A lot of money, but I was getting checks for, you know, twenty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars from different foundations. Right. And it was so. It was. Uh, it was not only just the Rockefeller. It was the. It was the um, foundation I mentioned, plus other foundations. All about a half of two dozen f foundations, who gave me money. And did all of this foundation money then enable you to start the Center for International That's Journalism? That's what it was. They gave me the money because I I, I wrote. I wrote proposals. How did I ever? How, I used to say, "How did I ever write these proposals?" But I did, uh -huh. asking for money, and they responded, and I ended up getting a, almost 200 journalists who came from all over the country, who didn't have advanced degrees, but would love to get a master's degree, and I interviewed them, and I talked to them, I cajoled them. And they came from every place. Mm -hmm. And um, we got a lot of people that way. And you actually, you, you didn't just spend time here on campus. You actually took these journalists abroad, right? <laughs> Places like Mexico and Cuba. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we were, the, the whole thing on the Mexican, Mexican border was uh, very hot stuff at that time. You know, Still is. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
we had a class of people that had come in and were in different classes, different faculty members uh, accepted these in their classes at USC. And I said to them, let's go to the Mexican border, see what that's like. <laughs> so uh, 12 of us went down the border one day, see what the thing was like. And we could see what the fence was like and how difficult it was. And one of them showed us how you get across the border. So they crawled out of the barbed wire, and I crawled out of the barbed wire with them. <laughs> and we went into, we were illegales, <laughs> we were illegal people going you the see, other way. You, you snuck across the border into Mexico? Into Mexico. <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> did I, how did I do this? <laughs> and, uh, and we snuck back, sneaked back. Sneaked. <laughs> but to show the, the story, I think I have a photograph someplace in this showing me this. And people said, Fromson, he's crazy. <laughs> no, he's not crazy. And uh, I've developed a tremendous camaraderie with an awful lot of great journalists who went on their own. One I can mention, Carol Morello, was the first person that I brought to the program. She was, with, she was the own reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and one of the first people I approached was Gene Roberts, who was then the president of mm -hmm. the editor of the New York Times. And Gene liked what I was trying to do, and he liked me because mm -hmm. we had met each other in Korea. And he, s he nominated Carol to be the first program to come to the program. And she was just a young reporter from Michigan, and she came here. She had no foreign experience and no interest in overseas. And uh, she came in here and did wonderfully. And right now, after these many, many years later, she's now the State Department correspondent for the Washington Post. And many of the people who were in the program got jobs, importantly throughout journalism, largely because of their experience at USC. While you were doing the Center for International Journalism, you had some influence on the Mexicans, didn't you, in terms of their open uh, records laws, in terms of them yes. passing a, a, a form of the Freedom of Information Act? Yeah, you know, you, you remind me of a lot of these things, but it, it, it's true. Uh, um, I admit some of the people in the program were Mexicans. Uh, Rosano Fuentes Perrain and a few other people like that. They came to become members of the program. They had, did not have university degrees. They got them by coming through our program at USC. Uh, and they befriended me. And, uh, well, they were terrific. I, I have a great affection for Mexico and the Mexican people and people from Latin America. I met some wonderful, dedicated people. They lived in, in countries where the dictatorships and the democracy was not well thought of many places. But there came a point when Rosana and some of the other people went back to the United States, but went back to Mexico after having completed their year together at USC. They came back and they joined a, a select group of people in Mexico and they formed a reporters committee for freedom of the press. And they st was the first piece of legislation ever passed by the Mexican legislation, and it has revolutionized Mexico, Mexican journalism. The Mexican, Mexican press today is free and open and critical, and it's set a great standard every place, and it makes me very proud to know that I had a hand in this and getting them started. Would you say that your work with the international journalists was your proudest accomplishment at uh, USC or w w w when looking back at, uh, on your well, time uh, here, w what gives you the most pleasure? I think on, a, on an individual basis, I feel pretty good, pretty good about that. Uh, it's long forgotten. I never got much ink. It's amazing to me. I mean, many journalists knew about what I was doing and very few ever reported it. And uh, the university hardly recognized it until they gave me the austere turn, uh, title of Professor Emeritus <laughs> to these days, which I'm very proud of. I'm very, I'm very thankful for that they have recognized us because I, I think USC is a great institution and it's uh, done wonderful things and supported an awful lot of great programs and I'm very proud to be affiliated with it. 
If uh, you were to give advice to the, the people who are carrying on your legacy here at USC, what would it be? What, what, what should they be doing to uh, Don't. help train the next generation of journalists? Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, I get people asking me to come and lecture to young people about what I can tell about my life and times and so on. And the title of my subject is Don't Give Up. You never know. Somebody's going to be there to help you. If you're there at the right time, if you convince them, maybe in a calm way, what you want to do and what your vision is, you'll get help. And I think it, I must, uh, without boasting too much, and I really don't mean that, I think it really energized an awful lot of people who were in this, pro coming back to hear me talk, who were, were already in their 30s going back to school. And it really gave them inspiration, hope that, yeah, well, maybe, maybe we can. Maybe we don't give up. And I think that's been the theme of my talk every time I speak somewhere. Don't give up. You never know. Somebody's going to be there to help you. Because there is a streak in this country of well-meaning people. I'm very proud of Americans. We, we, have, we get a dumb rap an awful lot of time in some of these countries, you know. And I think there are wonderful people here. We, we, just, we just had this wonderful book fair here at USC. And thousands of people coming here, reading books, buying books, talking about books. People care about a lot of things. You've got to give them credit, not be too judgmental. I think this country's great. I'm not being a patriot. I'm not waving a flag. And the reality is, from what I have seen in all the countries I've been in and lived in, places I've talked to, whether they range from Pandit Nehru in India or sitting across the table from Leonid Brezhnev, who was the dictator in the Soviet Union, seeing all kinds of people. I've seen lots of people. And I'm proud to say I'm able to make a comparison with the human race to see, you know, we're doing all right. You, uh, you've been on TV long enough to recognize the wrap-up signal, which is what I'm getting. Uh, are there any f final thoughts, anything that I left out in the questioning that you, th you think you need to uh, get on the record here? Well, as I was just saying, I think you, if you're in, at an age where things are not working out exactly right, don't lose confidence. Don't lose faith. Because in this society, this country, things happen. They really do happen. They may get advertised all over the place, but individuals will get breaks, will get opportunities that they never thought of before. And that's what's marvelous about the United States. Still a land of opportunity. Absolutely. Free. You know, we, we have our moments. Uh, we have politicians that irritate the devil out of us. They think that they're phonies, <laughs> overstate windbags, <laughs> but we can say that. Yeah. Nobody's going to arrest us for saying that. It's true. So, and we have an institution. Uh, I wish that the press <clears throat> was more aggressive than it is today. I'm afraid that there's a, a thing that concerns me more now than any ever before is that there is a confusion between truth and accuracy, between what is wrong, what is right. That's, that's a problem, and many journalists, uh, George, like you and I, and other of our colleagues we know and respect, uh, have a stronger feeling about what journalism can be in helping the country and helping the institution that we know of. All right. Well, Murray, thank you for participating in the USC Living History Project, sponsored by the USC Emeriti Center. Go the Trojans. Emeriti Center has recorded over 60 tapes that are available in the center, the University Archives, and the Davis School of Gerontology Library. Many are on USC YouTube. See you online. <laughs>